Greetings folks and welcome to the Electromaker Show. This is your midweek roundup of all things Maker and Embedded and lovely. Now this week we will be talking about the new Raspberry Pi operating system and also a very interesting little board which looks a lot like a Compute Module 4 but isn't. And of course we will be announcing the winner of our Digilent competition. We are giving away an Analog Discovery Pro, the most expensive and coolest prize we've ever given away on this channel. Also we'll be revisiting Crowd Supply, some of the things we've looked at there in the past that were pre-launch that have now been launched, funded successfully and you can get them and we'll be returning to a few of those. So with all that to get through, let's get on with the show. Now, just before we start the show, I just wanted to quickly mention um, there's a possibility that this could be the last Electromaker show for a while. Maybe next week's will be the last Electromaker show for a while. Maybe there'll be even two more Electromaker shows uh, or three more and then there won't be any for a while. In short, um, our second child is due relatively soon, um, and obviously it's very difficult to say exactly when they will be arriving, um, but when they do, I will be taking a short break from the show, and indeed all things. Um, uh, and in that case, the likelihood is I will be trying to get a Christmas show out in December. I might get another show out as well, um, but there's a possibility that I may not be back until uh, next year. Um, and if that is the case, and this is the last show before that happens, then uh, thank you for another wonderful year of Electro... Uh, what do I mean? Another wonderful... A, a wonderful year of Electromaker shows. Um, it's been going for longer than a year now, but um, but realistically, it started in uh, 2020. It's now 2021. Let's call it a year. Um, but uh, yeah, this might be uh, completely premature, and I might see you next week and be saying again this might be the last show for a while. But I thought I'd put that out there now because we're really getting into that time period where it could be happening kind of any time in the next couple of weeks. So, um, if you don't hear from me, it's for all the right reasons. Anyway, let's get on with the show. We're starting this week's show with the updates to the Raspberry Pi OS. This is Raspberry Pi OS Bullseye. Uh, now, this is named Bullseye after the horse in Toy Story. In case you didn't know, uh, Debian names, or the names of Debian releases, are named after Toy Story characters. Bullseye is the horse from Toy Story. Buster is the dog owned by Andy, the boy from Toy Story. Uh, yes, that's, that's why they have their names. Hey there, folks. This is Future Ian, and I've just discovered something super interesting, actually. I did a little bit of research when I was editing this show, um, and I was dimly aware that Toy Story names and Debian were linked, but I didn't realize that the project manager of Debian was working at Pixar at the time of Debian 1.1's release, hence it being called Buzz. And if you look at these names, Buzz, Rex, Bo, Ham, Slink, Potato, Woody, Sarge, Etch, these are all characters from Toy Story. Um, and I was obviously aware of the Toy Story connection, but I did not realize that the uh, project lead of Debian was working at Pixar. Just a little bit of trivia there I thought I'd throw in in the editing process. Anyway, let's get back to the Ian in process of show type thing. And now we have uh, Debian, Raspberry Pi OS, Debian, Bullseye, now for the Raspberry Pi. I probably could have said that in a slightly more clean way. Anyway, my word spaghetti aside, here it is. This is a Raspberry Pi Bullseye, and this is the Raspberry Pi blog. Um, well, one of the two Raspberry Pi websites we have now. Um, I've actually put two links in the comments, uh, in the uh, description for this one, because I, there's a rather good Tom's Hardware article here um, that gives you a good rundown too. And it also, um, it also actually has embedded the video we'll be talking about next on the show, which is from Jeff Geeling. But anyway, before we get to that, Bullseye, a new version of the Raspberry Pi OS. Um, and there are a few changes, most of which you won't really notice that much. It's mostly under the hood, um, which is nice. It's a sign that um, Raspberry Pi OS was already in a very good place. They didn't feel compelled to change all that much. So uh, realistically, if you're using Raspberry Pi OS, the thing you're going to notice the most uh, is probably a, a slight subtle change to the way the wi that windows look, and that is because of the change from GT GTK plus 2 to version 3, and uh, GTK, in case you aren't familiar, is a C library for basically creating windows uh, under Linux. Um, so if you've worked with Windows and you've made applications, you've probably worked with the Windows API. Um, there are various Python libraries that allow you to do it cross-platform as well. Um, but GTK is uh, sort of a standard version. I'm sure many of us who've messed around in Linux and tried to create their own uh, applications have played with it at some point in the past. Um, I didn't really understand how to program in C then. And to be honest, I probably still would struggle a bit with it now. But yes, that's one of the big changes and you will notice some differences. Um, in fact, here is a good example of that. Um, and of course, as always, the Raspberry Pi blog in the Tom's Hardware article will be saying it far better than I am now. I am waffling a bit. I am aware of that. Um, and there's also a new notification system, which looks like it's going to be quite nice. Um, so yeah, so just under the top right where you have your Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, sound and clock information, you have um, a system of notifications now. Um, but uh, as I've mentioned, uh, there's something else about this which is super interesting. Um, but before we get to that, uh, I will leave a link to the Raspberry Pi blog post in the description and also the Tom's Hardware uh, uh, article here. 
Um, but yes, there's some clues in this article as to what we'll be talking about next. Um, so maybe we should move on to that now. So yes, Raspberry Pi OS Bullseye is out, we just mentioned that, but this video from Jeff Geerling is super interesting. Um, just before we get to the video, this same Tom's Hardware article we were talking about and referenced uh, briefly a moment ago, um, there's something worth noticing here. Uh, now, uh, this uh, Raspberry Pi Bullseye, uh, Raspberry Pi OS Bullseye is based on the 32-bit version, but uh, as Jeff Geerling noticed, there is a 64-bit Pi um, uh, build from today, uh, which has Bullseye in the name. Um, and uh, it, but as it says here, it does not, doesn't know if it's based on the upstream Debian 11 or not, but some packages in the info file seem to indicate it is all latest. If you are interested in that, um, that's why I wanted to leave the Tom's Hardware article here as well, because it has a link to the video, which I'll be linking anyway, and a link to this tweet if you want to find your way to this. Uh, this is the 64-bit, allegedly, I haven't downloaded it to test, um, but yes, allegedly the 64-bit updated version of Raspberry Pi OS. However, this is the Jeff Geeling video of which I was referring to, um, and he goes through all of the same changes we've just talked about, but noted something super interesting, which is there's an updated version of the Broadcom chip that the Raspberry Pi 4, the Raspberry Pi Compute Module 4, and the Pi 400 is based on. Um, the, the, the updated version uh, has, uh, gets a free speed update, essentially, when you update to the new Raspberry Pi OS. Now, as always, I'd prefer you go and actually watch the video from Jeff and support him and then listen to what I have to say about it. However, if you do want to quickly check whether your Pi is equipped with the new chip or not, this is how you can tell. We have the uh, uh, the two designations here, one ending in 6BOT and one ending in 6COT. And of course, it is the later chip that you will uh, uh, you will want to have in order to make that work. And I've just realized I have a Pi in front of me, but I can't check because it has a heat sink on it. Ah, OK. <laughs> Slight distraction there. I will leave a link to this Jeff Geeling video in the description. And we've talked about Jeff a few times on the show um but uh, uh yeah i don't know if i've implicitly said that he is among the best youtubers talking about the raspberry pi right now he has a, uh, an encyclopedic knowledge of how the raspberry pi works the ins and outs of it has some great videos on making different kinds of servers with them and using different stuff just uh, uh, uh yeah I, I mean as you can see here his uh, youtube channel has grown i would say exponentially in the last year or so and it is absolutely deserved um but uh, yes once again another great video uh, from jeff talking about the raspberry pis that we know and love and if you do happen to have one of the new chips and are getting a significant speed upgrade do some benchmarks on your pi and leave a, a comment in the comment section saying how much better it is because i'd be super interested to see if you're getting that full extra 300 megahertz uh, that the chip is capable of Moving on to the Maker Faire. Now, we talked about Maker Faire Rome and their combined online and in-person event, and now it's time to talk about Maker Faire Orlando, because that's uh, happening this weekend, and you can tune in and watch it live over the internet no matter where you are in the world. So here on the Make Magazine website is a short news article from Caleb Kraft, who will be walking around the Orlando Maker Faire this Saturday, showing off everything there is to show. So um, the place you need to head to is under this link. It is their Facebook page, and it is at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, which will be, uh, now the clocks have changed again for us, but I don't know if they have for the Americans, so I think it's around 5 p.m. for me. I will check that, of course. Um, and it is a, a Facebook Live video, so um, it's probably worth heading to their page and already liking and following it, which I am doing, but not in this browser. Um, and yes, uh, there's also just a few interesting things on this page which uh, already have sort of got my uh, Make a Fair brain going because I don't know if you've ever been to a Make a Fair, but you do walk around and get drawn in by the very exciting things that people have created. Um, it is equally as exciting to see these crazy inventions as it is to just find actual versions of things that I've only seen on the internet and had to order from far away that took forever to get here. And like, oh, I can buy an accelerometer right now. Um, but yes, this is the three-dimensional can crusher, um, whatever that means. Um, this looks super cool. This is uh, Chipscapes, so uh, microscopic images of the inside of computer chips. Um, and th this is exactly how I feel. It doesn't sound that amazing, but look at that picture. I mean, look at that. That's beautiful. It really is. Um, and that, and of course, uh, there's the, the boom box bike as well. I'd certainly watch this video if you are uh, into, want to feel some nice retro nostalgia and LED strips and things on a bicycle. I'm, what isn't there more to love? Can you tell I'm a little overexcited about the prospect of make affairs? I can't wait till there's another one in Berlin. Anyway, um, if you would like to watch this, it is 1 p.m. Saturday, Eastern Standard Time. If you are in the area, um, you can actually go to the uh, in-person physical event at Make a Fair Orlando. Um, but yes, uh, me being far from in the area here in Germany, I will be simply watching it on the internet instead.
Up next, an article on the Hackaday website, and this is about the Radze CM3. Um, and you would be fooled for a second to think that you were looking at a Raspberry Pi Compute Module 4 here, but this is actually a board from Rad uh, Radze. I'm assuming that's how you pronounce it. Um, now, um, if you are want to, if you want to know about the board itself, um, there is a link in the article, um, and you can go to the Radze wiki and read about it. Um, uh, I, rather than go through all the details now, I'll tell you that it does stack up quite nicely to a compute module. Um, there's uh, things about it that are good, things about it that are bad. We'll probably actually talk about the board itself another day. Um, the title of this article is what I find interesting. Um, the idea that the CM4 begets a form factor, that um, for years now we have had boards that have tried to be the shape of a Raspberry Pi and do what the Raspberry Pi does for cheaper or do it better. And we've had lots of boards which are sort of various forms of Arduino shape or uh, a STM32 kind of shape or uh, Adafruit feather shape. Um, and they've all had different, uh, they've all had, sorry, uh, similar form factors while doing different things and sporting different chips. And this is an interesting thing because as it says here um, in a very well-written short article, um, is this the start of uh, people creating compute module style boards? After all, the, the compute module 4 is a, a really interesting thing. If you want all the power of a Raspberry Pi but want to control the ins and outs of it in a much more small space, um, yeah, it's the perfect thing. Um, so I just thought I'd uh, mention this and leave an article to the Hackaday, uh, leave an, a link to the Hackaday article in the description. And as mentioned, if you would like to read more about the Radza CM3, you can. Um, it supports the Rock Chip RK3566, which is a powerful little system on chip. Um, but yes, uh, I just think it's a really interesting thing, and I do wonder how many uh, compute module four alikes we will see going forward. And I do wonder whether they'll have the same issues as most Raspberry Pi alikes too, because at the end of the day, um, there are so many boards out there that are more powerful than the Raspberry Pi, but not one of them comes close to the support and stability and, of course, the community that the Raspberry Pi has. Uh, either way around, it's a very interesting thing to watch. Just before we move on, a little housekeeping. If you are enjoying the Electromaker show, consider subscribing to the Electromaker YouTube channel. Um, as you can see, uh, this is where you've uh, been watching the show. Um, and if you're not already subscribed to us, um, it is something that even if it won't change your day-to-day -day usage of YouTube all that much, it will make you more likely to show up on uh, out us, more likely to show up on your home screen, and it will make us show up in your subscriptions tab. But functionally, it doesn't change all that much. It does actually change things from our end because it shows YouTube that you like our show enough to be subscribed to it. Um, the same goes for the notification bell just here. If you set this to all notifications, then you will be getting notifications up in your browser here. Now, unless you've set your browser notifications to give you desktop notifications, which is something that fills me with horror, the idea of doing that, um, it just means that when you come to YouTube as a website, up here you will have um, a list of things that you have asked for notifications for, and any uh, channels that you are asked for notifications for, you will be told whenever they upload. In this case, this particular channel is only uh, it has set um, notifications for the Electromaker show so you can see these are the only ones that I get. Also, the video that you're watching right now, it would mean a lot to me if you could just scroll down and click like. I know it is an asinine thing for YouTubers to ask for likes, but it does make quite a difference in an algorithm-based thing like YouTube. Um, if you like it, then YouTube will look at the things that you like and then look at the things that other people like and make it far more likely to suggest it to, hopefully, like-minded people who will also come and enjoy the show. Now, those things on YouTube are the easiest way to support us for sure. They are free and just a few clicks. Um, another thing that you can do is under our community tab is, is head to our Discord server. Now, this is um, a private discussion server, uh, private in that uh, anyone can join it, um, but it's really only people who have come to the Electromaker website and clicked on it that can get in there. No one's going to end up there by accident. Everyone that is in there is a confirmed Electromaker fan, as it were. Um, the server is young, but it is slowly getting going, and it is another great place to share ideas and to just generally chat about stuff you can be fairly certain that anyone that is in that server um, will know what you're talking about if you refer to something on the show for example um, also, under the same community tab, you can upload projects to the Electromaker website. Um, and uh, these are the projects that you see uh, featured in the show every now and again. Uh, they don't have to be con uh, completed projects. They don't have to be tutorials. You could just show something off that you are busy working with. Um, as you well know, some of the things that I featured on the show before have just been a sort of proof of concept based around a maybe interesting micro microcontroller setup. And all that stuff is absolutely fine. Um, and uh, I always check the uh, Electromaker tab um, uh, for projects. And whenever I have the chance to um, in a week's show and um, when it isn't filled with other news um, I always make sure I put something from our community into the show um, and who knows um, if we really get an upkeep uh, an uptake sorry on community projects then I'll start doing special community project showcases again um, it's something I would really like to do by far and away, the best way you can support the Electromaker show is by buying things in the Electromaker shop. 
We stock things from all of the people you see scrolling across the screen right now, which is quite a dizzying supply of, well, suppliers, I suppose. Um, there will never be any obligation to support us financially. We don't have a Patreon or anything, at least not at this stage. Um, but the, the store is sort of our version of Patreon. If you like what we're doing, um, consider getting stuff from us um, next time you're going to start a project. Um, it will support our show, absolutely. Um, as always, however, there is no obligation. Um, the show is free. It is on YouTube for a reason. Um, and if you are supporting us on YouTube, that is more than enough. Um, but it is always nice to remind you that we do have a shop because everything that is bought from this shop will go directly towards supporting Electromaker and everything that we are trying to do here. Um, but anyhow, uh, that is it for this week's little bit of housekeeping. Thank you for your patience and let's get back to the rest of the show so on last week's show i talked about the analog discovery pro and i got quite excited about the whole thing um, and this is a wonderful piece of kit um, it is monetarily the biggest thing we've given away as well but i think it's also probably the most useful thing we've given away also um, in case you missed it this is a mixed signal oscilloscope that can work via usb to a host computer but it also has uh, the fpga running inside it and um, can run a linux file system so it can run completely headlessly and just be communicated with via serial you can write automated tests for hardware on this thing um, with the four uh, analog inputs and the two analog outputs and it also has a logic analyzer just here a couple of external triggers on the back at usb it's kind of everything that you need it's a really amazing bit of kit so for the past week people have been commenting on the electromega youtube channel saying what they would do with this if they won it and it is time for us to choose the prize winner now, of course, there can only be one winner, and uh, all of the ideas that we had were wonderful. They always are, and it's always very difficult having to pick just one winner when so many people have so many wonderful ideas with what they could do with a bit of kit. Um, but the winner of the Digilance competition for this week is Christopher Prosser. Now, um, he mentions it would be very useful in his latest project. He's working on a site-specific audio sculpture that consists of 10 physical actuators based on ESP32s, communicating via RS-485, dr driven by a single main computer. For the first time, I'm getting boards fabricated and assembled due to wanting to make many. I'm expecting problems, which is a very good thing to expect when you're fabricating your first boards. Um, I have never made something that didn't go horribly wrong the first time in one way or another. <laughs> so specifically, you think you'll need to troubleshoot the RS-485 uh, chip and uh, the measure the latencies when controlling them as they are multibus devices, and hopefully not have to deal with the I2S or uh, I2S squared S audio chip you're putting on some of the boards. Um, yes, that sounds like a fantastic thing and something that you will definitely need a mixed signal oscilloscope for. So congratulations, Christopher. We'll be in touch with you as to how we can get this thing out to you. Um, thank you to everyone who did enter this competition. And in fact, um, we're going to move straight on to have yet another competition because um, Digilent did not just send us an Analog Discovery Pro. They also sent through a hat for the Raspberry Pi, something I reviewed a few weeks ago. So let's quickly talk about that. Yes, a short time ago I spent some time with the MCC-152. Now this is a voltage output and a measurement device for the Raspberry Pi. And this is it you can see right here in my hand. Although of course this is a far better picture of it. Now we are giving away just the hat itself. This will fit on top of any Raspberry Pi which has a 40 pin output. And it adds precision measurement and voltage outputs to the Raspberry Pi. Um, and uh, this is actually from uh, MCC, uh, which is a company that makes measurement devices um, for a, a mixture of uh, the hobby and embedded uh, industry world um, but Digilent did supply this to us because Digilent do actually uh, uh, stock everything from measurement computing which is what MCC stands for and um, so the MCC 152 DAC hat is something that as you can see there is an article for on the Electromaker website I will leave a link to this in the description so you can read through it and see it to see if you are interested um, and uh, as just as we gave away the other one um, this is a wonderful piece of kit and I had a, a great time playing with it um, but as with almost everything that comes through our hands at Electromaker we want to get it into the hands of our viewers. Um, so if you are interested in the MCC-152, you can of course read about it on the Electromega website, and we are doing exactly the same competition to the one that we did last week in terms of how you enter it. If you are a subscriber to this channel, simply put in the comment section what you would do with a precision measurement hat for the Raspberry Pi, and give the hashtag MCC-152. No spaces, just MCC-152, and we will pick a winner in next week's show for this one. Um, uh, usually we'd have a little bit of a gap between doing specialized competitions, we just have 
mystery box competitions in between um, but in case I haven't mentioned it at the start of this show uh, I am somewhat expecting a baby to arrive any day now so we're, uh, we're getting all of these competitions out while we still have a bit of time to do so um, because at the end of the day um, it's nice to know what you're going to win ahead of time sometimes um, and this thing um, yeah I've already explained what it is but just before ending this section the one thing I would like to say about this thing is that I found it incredibly easy to use the documentation is fantastic and there's something really nice about being able to um, use just a really precision device um, either using um a GUI because there's a GUI that works in the Raspbian uh, operating system or from the command line there is a really rich set of example code and ways that you can work with it within your own code um, that I found really intuitive and fun to use and as with so many things that actually cross my desk I just wish I had a day-to-day -day reason to use something like this I have so little time to work on projects that um, it would be actually a bit of a waste for me to keep this and it would be a bit of a waste for me to, keep, to have kept the Analog Discovery Pro as much as it's painful to have to give that one away um, but yes, uh, this thing is going to be very, very useful to someone. If that you think that someone will be you, please tell us how you would use it in the comments and we will choose a winner and announce it on next week's show. So um, yes, we've given one thing away. We've announced another competition. It's been a very busy prize section, but let's get on with the rest of the show. Now, in this week's funding website things, we're going to do something slightly different. We've looked at so many things on Crowd Supply over the year and a half the show has been going, and many of those things were pre-launch. That means that um, there was information as to what they might be, and it was very interesting to look at, but we never actually saw how much they were going to cost uh, to buy, and we never found out whether they made their funding goals or not. So today we are revisiting three things that we featured on the show in the past to see how they did when they got into the Crowd Supply, and to see whether you would want to buy them now, knowing how much they cost, and whether they got funded, and all that kind of stuff. Now, since we've already talked about most of these things, I am going to whip through this rather quickly. Um, but the Pico DSP I wanted to start with partially because, well, as it says here, open source Arduino compatible ESP32 based audio development board is me all over. Um, and uh, I waxed lyrical about how good this was at the time. Um, and as you can see now, it, um, it has uh, reached its funding goal. Um, I am one of the people that helped do so. I have bought one of each of the versions that you can get. Um, and uh, oh, actually, that's not true. I did not buy the uh, Euro, Euro rack ex ex euro rack expansion module although i could see myself maybe turning it into a euro rack module at some point in the future anyway um this did reach its funding goal of nine thousand euros barely just made it over um but uh, as you can see here they have a thank you and uh, i can tell you that this thank you is probably the same one i received by email saying they can go into fabrication now yes it's reached its funding goal and can be put into production would like to offer up a sincere thank you for everyone supporting this campaign and for supporting open source design and collaboration so if you are interested in the P Pico DSP, you can head to the link in the description. The original edition is $42 and the strawberry edition is $42 as well. Up next is Slime VR. Now, um, as I mentioned at the time, I, I don't use VR chat. I don't even have a VR headset, but I love the idea of it. And I love the idea of these body trackers as well. Um, they're designed to be as simple as possible. They all use ESP32 and have their own motion tracking in them, which means that they can all make their own independent calculations and keep you looking pretty natural. And as you can see here from what is essentially just, I think, five points of contact, it's pretty interesting. It actually works really well. Um, so yeah, um, as mentioned, uh, this was something that was a pre-order thing. Um, there was no idea as to how much it would cost. Um, I assumed it might be uh, quite expensive, and it turns out it is not. Um, the full five set of trackers is $165, which for what it is, is incredibly cheap. Um, and there's uh, uh, other various versions that you can get as well. Um, if you are someone who likes VR or VR chat, this is something worth uh, coming back and having a look at. And yeah, I just remember at the time thinking it was such a novel idea to create um, essentially uh, standalone movement systems. And of course, these are open hardware and open source. You can hack them to do anything you want. Um, in my mind, the other thing that immediately jumps to mind is that I've just recently bought a bunch of cheap ESP32 development boards and a bunch of cheap inertial, inertial measurement units. Um, but I want to use them rather instead of VR, I want to attach them to various parts of my body when I run to see if I'm running well. That's just the thing that I'm into. This is an off the shelf thing that could do that for me um, if I wanted to, just it kind of comes to mind. Um, but yes, uh, Slime VR also uh, absolutely smashed their funding goal. I mean, look at this, it's crazy. They almost made a quarter of, a, well, they made over a quarter of a million uh, dollars of a uh, $180,000 uh, goal, which is absolutely deserved. I think there's a lot of VR people that will be very excited about this. 
Finally, we're returning very briefly to Couple Tag. Now, I talked about this when it was in pre-launch um, in, in a previous show, and I don't really want to repeat myself too much. So in short, as it says, it is a simple NFT, NFC tag, not an NFT, <laughs> a simple <laughs> NFC tag that uh, uh, logs relative humidity and temperature. Um, and uh, it is a v- very simple and beautiful thing. Um, I like simplicity a lot, and it is simple. It is hackable. It has a, a web app that you can hack yourself and turn into whatever you want. And I just wanted to come back to say, um, and uh, yeah, this was another token goal just a one dollar but they raised 1750 and couple tag is now available for 29 dollars um, or you can get um, a dev kit for 18 dollars um, which is uh, a includes the easy fed a basic low-cost msp 430 programming and debugging solution um, but yes uh, if you are interested in this um, i know uh, i talked about it at the time uh, there will be links to this and the other two things that i've returned to briefly in the description um, if there were things that you thought at the time oh that looks cool i wonder what happens with it you can have a look at this and uh, and maybe just read through them again and see if it's something that will be interesting to you um the reason that i'm doing this is because i've realized that i say so often we'll come back to this some point in the future and i never do so i'm going to try and make an effort to every uh, every few weeks or so go back to things i said i would go back to and uh, have another look at them and we can decide together whether they are as cool and as exciting as i thought they were so far all of these things absolutely have been we're closing out this show looking at a couple of projects and we're starting with the home garden kit by Ashokra or Ashok, I, I don't know how to pronounce that, apologies. Um, but this is a simple solution for a home garden with Cypress Bluetooth low energy mesh technology. Um, now, uh, this is, uh, as you can see, a project on the Electromaker website. Um, and it's a project that um, I was already aware of, um, but uh, I think I had it on the docket to feature in a, a couple of shows ago. It turned out there was a load of news that week and I had to bump a couple of things off. So I wanted to put it into this week's show, even though it's been around for a little while um, and what this is essentially is a, a smart home setup using blo- bluetooth low energy mesh now there's also a video linked from the uh, article which is definitely worth watching um, and this shows off everything in action this is an android app which is connected via bluetooth low energy to various different things in a mesh formation turning the light on and off and of course as you're about to see there is motion detection here as well because there's motion detectors built into the boards um, and it does a couple of things as well. Um, it, it, there's uh, one that is set up to a pump, which will uh, water the plant and give you a notification via WhatsApp when the plant is watered. Um, and uh, a little later on, it shows a servo-operated garage door, which is kind of a, a, a mock-up of uh, how a motorized door might work or something like that. Um, yeah, that pleases me. I like that. I, I, I don't know why, but the mock-up garage door pleases me quite a lot. Um, so I will leave a link to the uh, Electromaker project in the description of the video. Um, it's an interesting project in and of itself. It's really nice to see uh, something like this put together, like completely uh, from scratch. Home uh, Smart home systems are super interesting. Um, but also using these Cypress boards, which I'm not 100% familiar with. And I, uh, I, I really like seeing things that uh, use things that are slightly outside of my comfort zone. Maybe you will too. So um, yeah, I'll leave a link to this in the description of the video and you can go and have a read through it. And of course, head to the video and watch, um, uh, watch, uh, watch it in action. It is a really interesting project. And the last thing I wanted to talk about was this. Uh, this is the Nordic Power Profiler Kit 2. Um, now, um, over the last year, I've been sent a few different Nordic development kit boards um, to do reviews on, to just learn a little bit about. I've given a few away. Um, and uh, this is something that I've had for a while, um, but haven't actually had my hands on and played with because there's always been something else to work on. Um, and uh, to finally actually get this thing out and use it, I'm kicking myself because this is probably the most useful thing that I have reviewed and looked at in a while. Now, I wrote a MakerBoard Spotlight for the Electromaker website about this, um, and if you would like to read the long-form overview slash review of it, you can go and you can read through it. Um, I, I go through a bunch of different things on it, but in short, what this is, um, is a, a as, well a power profiler, obviously, but this is for reading current in uh, microcontroller projects, specifically reading currents from the uh, uh, about 0.2 nanoamps up to 1 amp. It's a very wide range, but all very low uh, current. Um, and this is uh, in a 0.8 volt to 5 volt range so again microcontroller range and um, one nice thing about this um, is the uh, uh, input and output here um, it's probably easier if I scroll down to here and show you on the screen um, there is uh, uh, you know you can run this in a configuration where you run the power in and run the power out so it's just in circuit but you can also set it up just as a power out and source power from it um, which means that it can be the power source for your project but also log the power in the app um, and the app if I can just find an image of it here um, is very easy to use very quick it's all part of the uh, NRF Connect suite um, and it's free um, but yeah in short I 
if you want to know the long version, it's here on the Electromaker website. Um, I was super impressed that something that comes in at about $90 can do as much as this thing can. I was always under the impression that um, accurate low current sensing is something that you required hundreds of dollars worth of kits to do. Um, but this is something that not only does it for, like I say, $90 with free software, which is quite easy to use. It's Nordic, so it's very well documented. Um, and I found it surprisingly useful. Um, uh, on the side here, by the way, uh, what, these logic ports here, um, this has uh, eight pins and a, uh, and a uh, power and ground pin here as well, which you can use as a sort of very basic logic analyzer. Something that in my testing I found actually really interesting because uh, if you are messing around with your code and you're trying to work out what's using so much power, especially if you're trying to do something very low power or battery powered, um, this is a way of seeing, oh, okay, when I trigger pin four, that's when the power spikes. I didn't expect that to be the thing that used the most power or not. Um, yeah. So uh, in short, I, I half wanted to sort of toot my own horn and say, look, I've wrote an article um, and feature it in the show. And half mentioned um, that if you are uh, looking for something for checking the power profile of your project, um, yeah, uh, uh, this is a really fun bit of kit. Nordic did send this to me for free, um, but it's the, probably one of the coolest things I've actually played with and probably the thing that's going to stay on my desk, um, at least for now, until I, until I give it away on the show at some point, as I inevitably will. Um, they're really awesome little things. Um, and if you are thinking of getting a tiny little pint-sized thing that can attach via uh, USB to your computer and essentially act as both power monitor and power giver to your microcontroller PCB project. Uh, this is definitely worth a little look. That is the Electromaker show for this week. Thank you so much for joining me and thank you for the continued support you are showing this show and me. Um, I've had some really wonderful interactions with people um, about the show. I've also had a lot of people wishing me well about the baby that's about to arrive any day now. Um, and, uh, uh, and also all of the usual stuff that I talk about. I mean, supporting the show on YouTube is uh, the best way to make it grow. YouTube is our platform. Um, but also uh, people who have been getting in touch to ask questions about stuff in the shop, joining the Discord, all of that good stuff. It really does mean a lot. Um, the Electromaker Show will be here uh, and continue to be here right up until the baby arrives. Um, but if I don't see you next week, I will see you soon. At the very least, if I have to stop for baby-related things, I'm going to try and get a Christmas special out. But I shall probably see you next time. Next time? Next week. <laughs>